Well, let's just dive in. Our first speaker today is going to be Debbie Lowry with Running Wild Catering. Um, so with this being the first time back together, let's make sure and give a nice warm welcome. the oldest one first so uh, I thought he'd go the other way around and I'd be last but anyway as uh, Chris said I'm Debbie Lowry with Running Wild Catering I'm one of the co-owners Teresa Walters is my other partner in the business and uh, we technically have been in business for 24 years um, we have um, we used to be Johnny's Catering um, back in the day and in 2010 uh, Teresa and I and another par partner bought them out and uh, we, since 2010, we've been running wild catering. So um, we're out there amongst them. We have survived the pandemic. We're hoping that it's slowly going to be over, but uh, it's been a rough haul. Um, I'll go about I'll go into struggles here in just a little bit. But um, I think one of the things that I want to bring to the table for anybody who's getting into business and trying to um, figure out what they want to do in their life is watch for the signals is what I want to say. Um, when I was 14 years old, uh, my grandmother had a lake place down at Fort Cobb Lake, and we went in there and ate dinner all the time at a little restaurant that was there, and uh, the guy didn't have a waiter, and so I thought, hmm, I think I'll start helping him get plates to the table, and so I started waiting tables. And at that time, I didn't realize that that's what I wanted to do with my life. I kind of thought, you know, this is fun, I love it, I'd rather be back there helping him cook, because I was learning to cook when I was 14. And, um, kind of started doing that and then you know I got out of I got out of high school went to college and when I went to school back in that day women didn't do the kind of things that I wanted to do uh, my dad was a home builder and I thought I wanted to build houses so I uh, went to college got that little secretarial degree from uh, Southwestern Oklahoma State University was what it was called back then and you know it was just um, kind of an evolution of getting where I wanted to be, but I had to take, follow the woman thing. And my dad was a little hesitant about letting me be a builder. He didn't think that that was, you know, what I should be. He wanted me to be an interior decorator and, you know, go that route. So anyway, I finally talked him into it, and I got into the building business, kind of making this long story as short as I can. And then the oil boom busted in Oklahoma, and we everything went under. And so we, he, he managed to hang on, but my business went under. So I started waiting tables again. I thought, here we go, let's start doing this. And I got real excited because I really wanted to be in the kitchen instead of in the out waiting the tables. I more wanted to be cooking and, and learning to do that because I've been cooking all my life. And the very one of the very first jobs I had was at a little barbecue house. And the owner of the barbecue house um, would not let me wash dishes. He would let me, or would not let me cook. He would let me wash dishes. And so I would go back there and I'd wash dishes and I just, I kept watching, you know, trying to see how the kitchen was flowing and what was happening and learning. Well, his sister happened to be a really big chef here in Oklahoma City and she got me into the uh, American Culinary Federation's program as an apprentice. And so I started studying with her and under her. And in Oklahoma, back in those days, we didn't have a lot of opportunities. Now we have Platt College and Francis Tuttle and, and all of that for training chefs. So I just learned on the job and I did all my training and I got certified as a chef in 95. And um, I did that for a while and, and, and I still kept looking for my fit. And I finally um, stumbled into um, catering uh, because I think the biggest thing for me was that being a chef, you had to work nights and weekends. And it was like, I don't really want to work nights and weekends. I was raised a lake girl. I want to go to the lake on the weekend. I didn't want to do that. So I started kind of looking around. And I, one of my first jobs was um, I, to get my um, certification as a chef, we had to put in, um, you had to do one year in each program that you were in. You had to commit yourself to one year to that. And it was a seven year program to get certified. So it was, it was long, it was, it was a commitment that you had to make and a long term commitment. So I started out um, at the Greystone restaurant up in Edmond and most of you are probably too young to remember that. But uh, I was up there, um, did about two years with Dr. Lamb up there. Dr. Virginia Lamb was the um, uh, safety and sanitation instructor at, at uh, uh, Central State. And she um, had her own restaurant and her sons were in it with her and, and did that. So I worked for her and then I moved to the track and the track opened and I was the sous chef in the penthouse. I did two seasons there. When we were in our off seasons, I worked at the OU faculty house. So 
All of this to say that it was all about learning each category of cooking. So you had to learn how to um, do grand manger, you had to learn how to do sausage, you had to learn how to be a fry cook, you had to learn how to do salad. I mean, each thing, knife skills, everything was a separate category and you had to spend a year minimum doing that and, and for them to certify me. And so it was very difficult at that time because again, there weren't a lot of opportunities in Oklahoma City to do that. And then there also were not um, any. There were not women were not accepted very well, and so it was really hard to you know to get there. Overcame all of that, went to work for the Snyder's and the grocery stores, and we did. I did. I worked for both Mike and Jim Snyder. I did Snyder's IGAs. I did three of those. I managed three of those in the delis in those. And then I went to work for Mike Snyder when he opened Market Plaza IGA out on Northwest Highway, and we went over. Um, I worked there, you know, we, he, he developed this whole home meal replacement thing in Oklahoma. He was the innovator. He brought um, home cooked meals into the grocery stores and you could buy individuals or you could buy bulk meals or whatever. And we did all of that. We brought it here from uh, a, rest, or a, a grocery store in Dallas called Eat Z's. We went down there and studied them constantly and brought all of those ideas back to Oklahoma City. And after about eight years of being in that, and I actually brought catering to Snyder's, so I did that whole thing as well. Um, finally, you know, a few other miscellaneous jobs, and then the owner of Johnny's Charcoal Broiler called me and said, I'm looking for a catering director, do you want to come on board? And I thought, well, I might want to do that. And I, you know, I was real wishy-washy about it. And I'm telling you these parts of, about being wishy-washy because of the struggles part, because you ask us to talk about struggles. You know, do I want to do that? Is this the company I want to do that with? They only cook burgers. You know, what? where do I want to go? And I was chef trained, so I was thinking this is not, you know, this isn't going to work for me. But um, came on board with them. Uh, when I went to work for them, I was the only person working there. I cooked all the food. I cleaned, washed the dishes. I made all the deliveries. I did everything. And in from 1997 to 2010, we built it from about a, we, our annual sales when I went on board was about 40000 a year. By the time I left, we were close to a million dollars in sales. And, and that's not all me. I don't want to take all that credit because by this time I had six or eight employees and, and we had really developed it into something that it needed to be. We kind of, you know, we, had, we, we changed our logo so that we didn't look like the charcoal whirler because it got to where everywhere we went, everybody wanted to know where their number three was or their number nine, or their, you know, and it was the, the whole hamburger thing was really hard to overcome. Um, so we changed our logo and put a piece of asparagus on there and made it all fancy and then all that. <laughs> you know, it kind of it kind of worked for a little bit and it was fine. But then they decided to get out. The boy, the guys wanted out. The main owner um, was not the brothers that owned the charcoal broiler, but another lady, and she was retiring and she wanted to get out. So we just ended up, after much ado and lots of hard work, we ended up um, buying them out and changing the name to Running Wild Catering. And that's a whole other long story I won't go into how they got there. But um, anyway, it's been fun. It's been long. It's been hard. Um, it's been, um, I, the only thing I can tell you that you need to do is study and learn about your craft and what you're doing and find all the education you can. Uh, you don't have to go to classes, but you can go online and you can learn and you can spend a lot of time um, <laughs> developing what you want to do and, and find the resources that you need. Thank goodness we have the internet now to do that. I didn't have that back in those days. So we had to just kind of research and find people who knew what you were doing and learn your craft from them. And so now I'm this close to retirement. I'm just about ready to pull the trigger and, and get out of it. But uh, it's, it's, it's been rewarding. It's been very, very rewarding. I can't say enough about it. Our next speaker is Kenneth Allen who, with Allen Autobody, who was also our sponsor for Build Northwest. So uh, maybe we'll give him one extra second of applause as he comes up. <laughs> the two ladies I'm working with today is kind of hard to follow those acts. But, um, Kenneth Allen, Allen Autobody, me and my wife owned it, or owned it. We've been in business for a little over four years now, working on our fifth year. My background is, I grew up in the south side of Oklahoma City. Went to high school at Douglas Hall, uh, high school, got bust over there. They actually had a body shop class there. So I thought, man, I'd like to take that. So I took it, first year I wasn't really sure if I liked it. Second year I took all mechanics, 
hated all the mechanics. <laughs> Went back and finished all the body, but the thing I didn't realize at the time was that the parts we were working on were like 55 Buick doors. And I'm going, and this metal is like hard, stiff. So we're working on this stuff, and I thought, yeah, this, is, this is all right, it's fun. We get out in the real world, and the cars, the metals are thinner. We're using different welders, different paint guns. It was an eye opener. So I had to jump in as a helper, start out, work my way around, worked at several dealerships here in the city. And then I finally had an opportunity, I was working for the auto collection. And I became a painter. The only computer I'd ever really used was the paint mixing station. So I had an opportunity to become a manager at one of the shops. A gentleman that came in and asked me, said, hey, would you run the shop? We've got a change going on. And I was like, wow, I was like, I don't know anything about it. He said, well, we'll teach you. And I said, okay. Well, somebody else came in and applied about the same time, and they got the job. So I thought, God, I don't have to do that. <laughs> so it went on for a couple of years. I had another opportunity pop up, and I thought, kind of like Debbie, after a while you start seeing the signs and you're like, something here for me. So I took that opportunity at Reynolds Ford, came manager up there. And I did that for about two years. My dream job was always to be a paint rep for paint manufacturer. And I was there for a little two years, so I had all the painting experience, a little bit of body experience, management skills. So DuPont came and asked me to apply with them. So I took that job and I stayed with them for 10 years. And everybody always said, hey, this is the dream job. Once you're in for five years, you're in for good. So I thought, man, this is great. And it was a great company. It was fun, had a lot of good times. But after being there for a little five years, they actually sold out the automotive finish side to exalt it. And it was still good. Things kept changing and they're minimizing things just like most companies do. And after a while, I kind of didn't have that feeling that I could move the needle is what I like to call it. After a while, you're just you gaining accounts, but you don't feel good on this side because when you go to gain an account in the body shop side, the manager or the owner in front, he's all happy to gain the account or to get switched over a paint line. But the painters in the back, they're upset because now they got to learn a whole new product. So those are always kind of the challenge. I was doing a lot of driving. So my wife, she's worked in the body shop business all her life as well. So for the last 10 years, she worked in the industry, uh, insurance side, of it, doing claims and adjusting and stuff like that. So. After I was kind of getting to the age where I thought, man, do I really want to take an opportunity, you know, a chance of getting moved out later on because young guys were coming in. So I thought, well, there's an opportunity to buy a body shop. So I thought, let's, let's look at that. She was like, I ain't buying a body shop. So I said, okay. So after a while, she kind of wasn't like in the corporate world as well. So she said, let's try it. So we did a business plan and a gentleman at church asked us if we would go to see one of his partners that he knew from he's a accountant. So we went to talk to one of the guys at the bank and he said, Hey, I can get you set up the SBA. I always heard how hard it was. I'm scared to death of that. We got in there and we got approved before I knew it. I mean it took a few years to get all this done, but before I knew it we got the buy shop bought. So we got in there and most shops are direct with their, with the insurance companies. They call them DRP programs, direct repair. And they kind of dictate the way you're gonna fix cars for them. And that's okay, but not everybody wants to go that way. So after we got in there for a year, I thought, man, our business plan is going to change. So we had to change that. We got back in there and we started looking at the way cars are being fixed. And we have a passion for it, me and my wife both. And I don't know if you, some of y'all have had several of y'all be as customers. But we do things different than most shops. And it's because I like working with people. I like to give a good product. I like getting the reviews. You know, it makes you feel good about it. The struggles we've had along the way is a lot of yourself now. You kind of doubt yourself a lot of ways. So you got to get over that. Uh, employees, of course, like with everybody, it's a struggle. You know, you, especially when you first start out because you don't have the reputation yet. A lot of people are like, well, you know, you're not big enough yet. You're not. So it's hard getting those type of people to come work for you. So you just got to keep building it, doing a lot of the work yourself, putting in the long hours, long nights. And eventually, before you know it, some of those employees come knocking on the door to hey, I'm not hearing about you, I'm seeing things, and they actually come on board. And once you get the right customers and you know being a part of the chambers is a big deal for me. I don't know. You know just talking on that. In our industry, I say most of the work comes from the insurance companies. Because I'm not direct for them, all my work comes from you guys. Church people, friends, family. So it's not just directly sent to me from the insurance company. If anything, it's actually directed away from me. 
because I do it the way it should be done. I follow manufacturing procedures and all that stuff. So it, it gets to be a challenge. So there's some weeks we're going, man, is there anything going to show up this week? And I'm blessed to keep showing up. You know, so putting in hard work and like Dave said, just research, 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 because and just expect the unexpected because you think you're not going to make it and then a heater goes out and you're like, wow, okay, now what? So you, you'll get through it. You just got to quit down yourself and keep going. So kind of rambled on. But, so that's, that's me. Been doing it four years. Um, our final speaker for today is Kirsten Land with Land Roofing. Uh, when she's done, for the for the other speakers who are comfortable, we will open up for some quick for some Q and A. So if you do have questions about uh, what they've spoken about, we'll have a few minutes at the end to do so. so let's give a nice big hand for Kirsten. Well, thank you for having me today. This is my first time to attend this event, but I hope to come back. I really enjoyed it. Um, as you said, my name is Kirsten Land. Uh, my story is pretty diverse and complex. <laughs> um, I am a mother, I was a teacher, I, I am a widow, and I'm a business owner. Um, and so <laughs> that lends a lot to the, to the story. But um, so I think I'll just start my, I do own a roofing company. We service residential homes mainly. Um, and we are located in Edmond. We love helping homeowners who are unsure about whether or not, you know, they have an insurance claim if they have roof damage and need help, so we help them with that. Um, the company was started in 1986 by my late husband, Brian Land, and contrary to the speakers who spoke before me, uh, roofing was not my passion and chosen profession. Um, <laughs> my, my chosen profession and passion is teaching, which really ultimately is helping people. And so when my husband and I got married, I've been with him since the beginning when he started the company. We were students at OSC. I remember asking him, I'm sorry, why are you at OSC when you just want to start a roofing company? But it was really important to him to get his degree. And he really loved roofing. And so I started working with, I taught for 12 years. And I started working with him after we adopted our first son from China. And I thought I was going to be a stay-at-home mom, and evidently he had other secret plans, so he brought me into the company to help him work. And so I was able actually to use a lot of my teaching skills to help me run the company with him, and so I became the sales manager. Um, my specialty in teaching was I was a special ed teacher, so many people said it would lend yourself well to helping salespeople. <laughs> um, so, uh, unfortunately, in 2019, my husband died, and leaving me with that decision of what do I do. So I decided to, it didn't even, I didn't think about it. My son said to me, what about the business? And I said, well, I can sell it and stay home with you. They're like, no, keep it. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll run the business, and thought, I'll do that. Well, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I had always run things with Brian. Running things now without Brian was completely different set of challenges. One, you're doing this with grief, which is exhausting, it's tiring. Um, you know when they say your better half, I never really understood what that meant until I lost my better half and they're like, oh, it's like you lose half yourself. Who am I by myself without my husband? That was a challenge that I've been dealing with for the past two years and then also not realizing being a single mom had never planned for that in my life. I thought I'd always be married. So a lot of new things were happening. And then, to top it all off, six days after he died, we get a hailstorm. And someone said, oh, well, that's, you know, that's Brian sending that to you. I was like, no, Brian loves me. <laughs> <laughs> Brian loved me too much. He knew I would not be excited about a hailstorm, which I was not. So my team, who was still reeling from the grief of losing Brian, I'm reeling from the grief of it, and we're having a funeral all in the middle of it. And then, um, we have to get to work to help people. So one week after his service, I'm in the office answering phones. Not everybody knew that Brian had died. So that was not fun having to explain that to people as I'm crying. So eventually I just said, I'm not answering the phone anymore. You guys get that. I'll help out in other ways. So we mobilized the crews and we, we were able to help a lot of people, but it was not easy. I had um, employees that 
understood. I said to them, we're going to keep things the way it is for one year. We're going to keep our system business as usual, just with up Brian. And some people fell in line with that. Some people took it as an opportunity to do their own thing. And so they literally were working my business, doing it their way, which made it very challenging. And the whole team really struggled. And it, it just put a lot of a team that was before Brian died, was very united, got along really great, did well. All of a sudden, we were not that anymore. So the family we were the day after he died, really was breaking apart. It was really sad, so another form of grief. So I lost, on one day I lost two of my sales reps. So now I did, Brian was my number one sales rep. He was gone, and he was the founder of the company, and knew what he was doing, and very well respected. And then I lost my two sales reps. So now I'm right <laughs> with no sales reps, and um, trying to run a working company, and I'm scared of heights, so I don't get on roofs myself. So I had to pivot very quickly and figure out what to do. My staff stepped up, and people who normally did not do roof inspection, although they knew what they were doing, they were getting out there and they were helping, our roofers were helping us, and so I hired some more people. Um, and this, all this was happening, and keep, the way we work our businesses with referral partners, so as I lost my two my my main my two main sales guys after Brian, I lost a lot of referral partners as well. So a big part of my business was just disappearing between my fingers. And I thought, what have I done? I'm running this wonderful company, or was wonderful, and making it horrible now. Just for what reason? And so I really had to struggle with: Do I want to keep going? Is that the responsible thing to do? Because caring for people is a very part of my. The, is, that, is that my heart, is that I want to take good care of people. To know that we were disappointing people was devastating. Not only did I lose Brian and everything in my life had changed, and I didn't mention this part, but I lost my mom a month and a half before Brian. So it was just, it was just chaos upon chaos and a lot of questioning. Fortunately, the good news is I had a lot of great people in my corner, my business coaches, I had other uh, friends who were also referral partners who just got in there with me and they helped me, they encouraged me. And I was able to um, just keep going, just get up in the day and just in brief counseling they talk about just do the next thing. And that became my daily mantra, just the next thing, the next thing. There was some days when I get up and think, I can't do this anymore, but I wanted to help people and I thought I'm not gonna fail, I'm not gonna quit. So I really leaned on other people to to, to help and guide me through and to give me advice. And the one thing, as a business owner, I've always invested in myself. And so I invested in Vistage, and, I'm in a, and I invested in Sandler training, and I read, and I, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I listen to other people who've done things that seem even harder than what I've been through. And that is what has gotten me through that. And I will say that I'm still dealing with a lot of uh, fallout um, Two months ago, I lost three employees in one week, so that was my personal best. Four was two in one day, but um, so not really one that you want to keep repeating, and that was another personal low. And I remember my very good friend, she's also a business owner, she came and she helped me in my office. We got everybody settled and what we were going to do, she said, now we're going to lunch. You're taking me to lunch. So we go to Zoe's Kitchen in Edmond, and I'm sitting there ordering. And it was the most surreal moment of my life. I just, or one, I should say, uh, just this out of body, like, what have I done? I am just terrified. And I start to have a panic attack, and I'm sobbing. And I go sit down, and I can't breathe. And she's helping me breathe through it. And a woman walks up to me and says, God says you've got this. And I'm thinking, <laughs> OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> like, anybody answer her? But it was, it was so scary. I I'd lost the more pivotal people to my business. Um, but I will tell you, since then, it's been the two best months following the two worst years of my life. Um, I have finally gained control of my company. We have a vision, we have a plan, we have core values we set in place, um, and my team is behind my back. And now, as you know, we just had another hailstorm in Norman, which is not necessarily our backyard, it's not our biggest area, so it's just, unfortunately, it's a lot of damage for Norman, but it's a good size for us, and we've been helping a lot of people on our team to be working well together, and during this time, normally I'd be answering phones and stressing, I've actually been able to continue to work on the business instead of in the business, so 
I will say, I've only been able to do this for two months, so I can't sit up here and say, hello, I'm done. You're never done. <laughs> you never know what that next thing is. But I think the thing that taught, we've all learned, and I've learned through all of these things, include, and then also COVID, is that you've got to keep pivoting and keep looking for new ways and thinking outside the box and rely on people you know who are successful. Look, continue to invest in yourself and invest in your what you're doing. So I pay for a bookkeeper. I pay for someone to do my website. You know, pay for IT services. What I can't do well, I hire out. And that's what has helped us tremendously to build the business where it is, but what continues to, to make the business run. And we're not the business we were when my husband was here. And I know we we'll never will be again. But we can be the Kirsten Land roofing business and um, help a lot of homeowners, which is what I really want to do where my heart is. Thank you for letting me share with you a little bit today.